Hi, I'm Doug Hayhoe and I've written a series of short video essays and podcasts on science, faith, and other topics. Most of the videos relate to one of God's two books, Nature or Scripture. This video, Nature and Scripture Proclaim God's Glory, is about both of these books. Glory is a concept hard to define, but examples from God's two books can help us grasp its significance. When I first taught physics, I liked telling stories about storms, how to avoid them, and how to avoid being struck by lightning. But those were just stories I had read. Then one June, I learned the real way. In preparation for summer camps, some of us took a canoe trip down the French River in southern Ontario. On our second day, a huge dark thundercloud was following us. Unfortunately, the river banks were too steep for us to stop and set up our tents for protection. Some of us were panicking, others were praying. Here's a picture of the French River where we were paddling. You can see there's no place to stop. Suddenly, around a bend in the river, a small island appeared in the middle of the river with one tall tree on it. We quickly landed, got our tents up and ourselves into the tents just before the storm arrived. A few minutes later, there was a deafening crash just outside our tents on the island. A strong bolt of lightning had struck the one tree on the island. Fortunately, we had known enough to pitch our tents within a 45 degree cone extending down from the top of the tree so that the tree would shield us from a direct hit of lightning, but not too close to the trunk of the tree for the lightning to transfer to us. What a phenomenal, terrifying experience that was. This is just one example of the glory of God. King David had a similar experience. He was up on a mountaintop when a huge storm came in from the Mediterranean Sea. He could hear the thunder rolling across the water. He saw the lightning strike the great cedar trees of Lebanon. Fascinated, he wrote a poem about it. It's in the Bible, Psalm 29. For David, the huge crashes of thunder and powerful strikes of lightning were God's voice in creation, declaring his glory. David put it this way, quote, The voice of the Lord is over the waters, the God of glory thunders. In his temple all cry glory, Psalm 29. The greatest display of God's glory in nature, however, is the night sky. Even before telescopes were invented, a good human eye could make out stars, stellar clusters, nebulae, and even a few galaxies such as Andromeda. How much more today when we can look through common telescopes or see images from the Hubble and James Webb Space Telescope? You can see my essay, How the Telescope Changed the World, for more details. Another poem in the Bible, Psalm 19, begins by saying this, the heavens declare the glory of God. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says, There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For star differs from star in glory. So if you want to see glory, look up on a clear, dark night, preferably outside a city. My grandson, Gavin, has taken up astrophotography. Using his mother's single-lens reflex camera, an amount that he calibrates to rotate with the sky, he takes time exposure photos. Here are a couple of photos he's taken recently. So on the left, you see the, the um, Pleiades star cluster that's mentioned in the book of Job and other places in the Bible. And on the right, you see the Orion Nebula, also mentioned in the Bible. On a trip to Virginia, Professor Lytton Musselman, a renowned botanist who lives there, took me to visit Piney Grove Preserve. The towering trees are kept free from development to protect a rare bird, the red cockaded woodpecker. As we stood there looking up at the bird's cavity nests overhead, we marveled at the trees reaching up to the blue sky overhead. The glory of it overawed us. We felt like we were in God's sanctuary. There you see it. Incredible. Don't know that you can see any uh, nests that are actually put into the trees by the calcated woodpecker. Lytton Musselman suggests that we stop for a moment and praise God. When I later looked in the Bible to see if trees were said to declare God's glory, this is what I found. Quote, 
The glory of Lebanon will come to you, the fir and the cypress tree together to adorn my sanctuary. That's in Isaiah 60. The glory of God is also demonstrated in common flowers in the field. One day Jesus pointed to one and said, Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. That's in Luke 12. In his book, Solomon Described Plants, a Botanical Guide to Plant Life in the Bible, Professor Musselman says this was probably the anemone, common in the region of Palestine. So there's a picture from his book, The Anemone, when Jesus said, consider the lilies. We've seen examples of the glory of God in nature. Now let's talk about the glory of God in scripture. Shortly after the start of the new millennium, Rebecca Idestrom, professor of Old Testament at Tyndale University, became fascinated with how often God's glory is mentioned in scripture. When she read Moses' request to the Lord in Exodus 33, show me your glory, what Moses requests of the Lord, Professor Idestrom decided to make this request her own. This initiated 15 years of intense study in addition to teaching her classes on God's glory. In February 2023, we were rewarded when she finally published her book, Show Me Your Glory, The Glory of God in the Old Testament. There's the book. There's a picture of her from the Tyndale website. In her book, Ida Strom explains that the key Hebrew word for glory in the Bible is kavod. It occurs 200 times, of which half refer to God's glory. Synonyms often found with it are splendor, majesty, power, and presence, i.e. God's presence. Ida Strom writes, quote, One could argue that every manifestation in, of, in Scripture is a revelation of God's glory. Every manifestation of God in Scripture is a revelation of His glory. The verb to glorify God also occurs numerous times, meaning to honor and respect Him as God, the Sovereign Lord. The key Greek name for glory in the New Testament is doxa, and the verb to glorify or honor is doxazo. It has a similar meaning as kavod. Doxa and doxazo occur 160 times in the New Testament, of which the great majority refer to God the Father or Jesus Christ. We still use that Greek word today. For example, a doxology is a short hymn of praise glorifying God. Quote, speaking about God can be daunting, Stephen J. Nichols states at the beginning of his essay, The Glory of God, Present and Past. He continues, The glory of God is the compass that keeps all of our theologizing, pastoring, and Christian living pointed in the right direction, towards God and not towards ourself. In other words, our true north is God's glory, not our own. The God of glory first appeared in the Bible when he called Abraham the father of Israel who was living in the pagan Sumerian city of Ur. That's in Acts 7 and Genesis 11. God appeared to Abraham to call him to follow God. Many centuries later, God appeared in his glory to Moses, the leader who took Israel out of Egypt. When Moses met with God on Mount Sinai, his glory was so bright, Moses had to hide his face in a rock. After, his face was so radiant that people couldn't look at it, described in Exodus 33 and 34. God's glory represented his presence with his people, not only at Mount Sinai, but also as they traveled through the desert. It was in the cloud by day and fire by night, his glory. It was in the ark they built and in the tabernacle. Once in the land, God's glory was present in the beautiful temple they built. Sadly, however, at the end of Israel's history, the prophet Ezekiel saw the glory of God finally leave the temple because of all the abominations occurring in it. That's described in Ezekiel 10 to 11. In her book, Professor Idestrom follows in detail this history of the glory of God. Every year at Christmas, we hear the story of Christ's birth. That's when God's glory returned to Israel many centuries after leaving it. This time it returned in the person of Jesus Christ, God's Son. On that amazing Christmas night that Jesus was born, the angels appeared to the shepherds and, quote, the glory of the Lord shone around them. And the angels sang, 
glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will to mankind. The shepherds immediately went and saw the new baby Jesus. Then they returned home, quote, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen. Glory is mentioned three times in connection with Christ's birth. The Gospel of John takes us deeper into what happened when Jesus came to earth. Quote, the word became flesh and made his dwelling or tabernacled among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John chose that Greek word tabernacled very carefully. The same God of glory who lived in Israel's tabernacle and temple in the past centuries now tabernacled in the person of his son, Jesus the Messiah. The author of Hebrews said the same thing when he wrote, quote, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. That's in Hebrews chapter 1. The Gospel of John takes us deeper into what happened, though, when Jesus came to earth. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, as we have seen. So here's a little graph or text that I've taken. We see the glory of God in the face of Christ. God, who said that light shine out of darkness, made His light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God's displayed in the face of Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote that. Where does the biblical story end? When Jesus returns to earth as the triumphant Son of Man, his glory will radiate in every direction like the crepuscular rays from the sun, as we'll see in the picture in a moment. Christ is coming to reward his faithful followers. Jesus had another message, a message in prayer, for those who honor him in this life. Before going to the cross, he prayed, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you gave me because you loved me before the creation of the world. It will take us all eternity to see this glory. Thank you.